Good morning, Lebanon Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today for worship. We're thankful that you've decided uh, to tune in. We wish that we could be in person, uh, but we're thankful for the capabilities that we have to record our services so that you can remain in your homes safely with friends and families. If you're a guest this morning, if this is your first time uh, watching our services, or maybe your second time, or maybe you've just never taken the time to connect with us, I want to encourage you to fill out the digital connect card link there in the description of this video. It's also going to be in the comments. Let us know you're watching. Uh, We'd love to connect with you this week just to say thanks for uh, being a part of our worship service. In just a moment, our worship team is going to lead us in a few songs this morning as we gather to worship. And they come in on Saturday night to record these songs together. And we're thankful for their dedication and their willingness to do this, to put this together so that we can worship in our homes uh, today. Uh, We're also thankful for our AVL team. Uh, Josh Treadway and Kyle Gordon uh, also came in on Saturday night to make sure this uh, took place. And so if you see uh, one of these members in the next few weeks, let me encourage you just to uh, give them a high five. Let them know that you're thankful for them. Uh, We wouldn't be able to put this on without them. I also want to encourage you that you can worship through giving today as well. Uh, You can give your tithes and offerings online at lbcnow.org forward slash donate. And uh, you can give back to the Lord for what he's given to us. I also want to encourage you, lastly, if you've never signed up to receive our email or text communications, we're going to put a link in the comments uh, to sign up for those, our weekly emails, to stay in touch with everything we do around Lebanon Baptist Church. Make sure uh, that you join us for that and be a part of that, uh, again, as we strive to reach our community and to reach those who are far from Christ. So let me encourage you to do that. Let's pray together. Uh, And and I ask that you prepare your hearts this morning as we uh, worship the Lord today. Father, you're good to us. We're so thankful for uh, the privilege to worship. Even though we're not in person today, we can do that uh, digitally. And we're thankful for the capability. Lord, I ask as the word of God is preached today, uh, that you will uh, touch our hearts and that you will change us, Lord. Uh, to live according to what your word says. I pray, God, as the people uh, of Lebanon Baptist Church and those who are uh, guests this morning as they gather uh, in their homes, Lord, that uh, they will worship today. They will worship the one true and living God. We're thankful for today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory, yeah. the 
were royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise, so we were the beggars, now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're Jesus, do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing, and you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can save. Let me tell you about.
Thank you again for joining us this morning for our worship service. We're going to take a pause uh, in our series called Who's Your One? Pastor Matt uh, will be picking that up uh, next week, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Today, I want to offer some encouragement and challenge uh, for your heart from the book of Hebrews. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up or turn them on to Hebrews chapter 12. As you're turning there, I want to tell you a story. It was the opening round of the 1,500-meter dash in the 1972 Olympics of Munich. There were 10 men on the track, but the focus was on one man, Jim Ryan. The world record holder was undefeated for three years before he lost in 1968. The world awaited this rematch in 1972, but it would not happen. During the third lap of the opening round, Ryan tripped over one of the runners. He laid on the track for at least eight seconds while all the other runners continued. Suddenly, though, he sprang up and ran as hard as he could until he crossed the finish line. Although he came in 10th, Jim Ryan received the loudest cheer from the crowd. He didn't qualify for any medal that day, but he did finish what he started. There's something that Jim Ryan had during this race that every Christian needs in this life. It's called perseverance. It's called endurance. It's continuing to go when the going gets tough. And today I want to spend a few minutes challenging our hearts to do just that. The book of Hebrews is filled with many examples and many illustrations of what it means to keep going. If you have your place there in Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to spend a few minutes in the first two verses this morning. The message of Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, is simple. It's this, don't stop running until you have finished the race of faith. Don't stop running until you have finished the race of faith. The book of Hebrews was written to an at-risk group of Jewish Christians who were thinking about forsaking Christ. The book is predominantly what we call expositional, but when the author gets to chapter 12, he shifts gears and begins to offer advice for his readers. Our text begins that practical section of this book. It's here the writer describes the Christian life as a race, the type of race uh, that all of us should consider. But it's not simply a 50-yard dash. The author is telling us that the Christian life is more like a marathon. It's long distance. It's difficult. It's agonizing. And because of that, the author of Hebrews sets out in these verses to encourage and exhort his readers and us to practice some perseverance and to stay in the race. And the same goes for us today as 21st century believers but as we know, this task of perseverance for us is a lot easier said than done. I know it's hard to stay faithful in the Christian life. Here, here are just a couple examples. I can't help but think about my own profession. Just this past week, I read that over the past year, as a result of the stress of COVID-19, 38% of pastors have considered quitting. Over the past two years, again, as a result of the pandemic, teenage emergency room visits for suicide attempts, and I quote, increased significantly due to the pandemic. One last example I'll give you that I think will hit home for all of us. While the final verdict may still be out on this, I believe one thing the pandemic did was destroy cultural Christianity. What is cultural Christianity? These are the members or attenders of a church who uh, likely were not Christians or were nominal Christians who came to church simply to be accepted culturally. These cultural Christians learned that during the pandemic, it was not a big deal to miss church for the lake or for the camping trip on the weekends. They learned that the Panthers game on Sunday was more valuable than the worship service at their local church. And as a result, they discovered that it was no problem for them to never return. I'm sure we know someone like that. Uh, they probably aren't watching this service this morning. All of these individuals, in some way, remind me of the readers of Hebrews. They have been tempted to quit the race 
And in some cases, they have. They have found more satisfaction in the fleeting pleasures of this world than the eternal benefits of living for Christ. And friends, listen, this morning, those of us who know Christ need to be reminded of this fact. We could also fall into the same trap if we are not careful. The race of the Christian life isn't easy, but it's worth it. But the truth of the matter is this. We must learn what to do to stay in the race as we face the temptations to quit. And so the overarching question for us today is this. What do we need to do to stay in the race? That's what we're focusing on this morning. We need to run a certain way. That's the simple answer. In fact, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, lays out for us three specific ways you and I need to run so that we stay in the race of faith. And so over the next few minutes, I want to challenge us today to look at these three things and to encourage our hearts to stay in the race. Let's now look at Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Notice verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're going to jump right in this morning. The first way we need to run to stay in the race is this. We need to run remembering the encouragement from heaven. Let me say that again. We need to run remembering the encouragement from heaven. It's clear that all of us need motivation. We are creatures who need to be motivated. We need a reason to do things, and we need encouragement while doing them. And I believe the author of Hebrews also understood this as well. He knew that one of the greatest motivations to his readers would have been to look into the past, to look at the heroes of their faith who had lived a life of faithfulness, and as a result, offer some encouragement to keep going. Notice again the beginning of verse 1. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. Now, the first question we need to answer is, who exactly is this great cloud of witnesses that the author is using to motivate his readers? Well, first of all, I think it's important we understand what they are not. I don't think they are saints who are looking down from heaven on us as we run the race of the Christian life. Uh, There's not this heavenly arena with surrounding bleachers that these saints sit in and watch the game of life that we are competing in. I think it's better to understand this great cloud of witnesses as testimonies, as examples of the kind of life that pleases God. One author put it this way, I thought it was good. It's what we see in them. Not what they see in us, that is the writer's point here. So don't think of this great cloud of witnesses as onlookers into our personal lives. Instead, we are looking to them as witness bearers or proof that it is worth it to stay in the race. Now, who exactly is this great cloud of witnesses? It's clear from the context that it's the hall of faith. It's all of those faithful saints just mentioned in chapter 11. These saints opposed Pharaoh. They forsook the pleasures of the world. They passed through the Red Sea, shouted down the walls of Jericho, conquered the kingdom, shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the power of fire. They were saints that were mocked, beaten, persecuted, imprisoned, stoned, and killed, all for the sake of their faith, never giving up, never quitting. And now the author of Hebrews is telling his readers back then, and he's telling us now, consider them for encouragement. So again, you want to find encouragement? You want to know what to do to stay in the game? You want to know what to do to stay in the race? Look to those saints who have already done it well. They are an encouraging testimony of how to keep going. We don't have to turn back far in the New Testament to find faithful saints 
uh, who have stayed faithful. Just go back a few pages to 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, probably the greatest Christian uh, to ever live, gives us some encouragement by showing that he himself lived a life of faithfulness. Listen to what he says here. He says, I have fought the good faith. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. And by the way, for those who don't know this, the Apostle Paul suffered great persecution. He experienced great suffering for the majority of his ministry. In fact, it's a ministry that I don't think any pastor or Christian would wish upon himself. Church history actually tells us he was beheaded for his faith and yet remained faithful to the end. I could go on forever on illustrations, but I thought what I'd do is I'd share a story with you that happened a few weeks ago. We took some of the kids in the children's ministry to visit uh, some of our senior citizens here at the church. We decided uh, to take them to Mr. and Miss Woody's house right up the road here. And for those who don't know Mr. and Miss Woody, they have been members of Lebanon Baptist Church since 1962. And they've been involved as teachers and leaders since 1963. Uh, they are now in their mid to late 80s but they are still teaching, serving, and loving the Lord here at Lebanon. In fact, Miss Woody still handwrites all of her weekly Sunday school lessons. I always love to get one of the encouraging words that she has following one of her lessons on Sunday. If you ever walk down the hallway where the classes are on, on Sunday morning, you'll hear Mr. Woody teaching, or what I like to call preaching. <laughs> and I promise you, you will quickly come under conviction. But as we were standing there with the kids a few weeks ago, Mr. Woody started giving these kids and leaders some advice. And by the way, when, when Mr. Woody or Miss Woody start talking, I'd encourage you to listen. Because I promise you what's about to be said is some gold. And I knew that's what's going to happen. And so I was sitting there. And, and some of the, the best advice I've ever heard came from his lips. Uh, these two individuals have lived faithfully, and here's what he said. He said this to the kids and those watching. I've watched this over and over again in my life. When you give to the Lord, he will give back to you double. I thought that was so good. What he said in essence is, it's always worth it to remain faithful to the Lord. It's always worth it to remain faithful to the Lord. What an encouragement from, from two individuals who have done it well. So let me ask you today, those watching this, how are you doing? Are you finding yourself discouraged? Do you even have a desire in your life to stay faithful to the Lord and His purpose, purposes for you? Listen, those are tough questions. But all of us today need to ask those of ourselves. And here's the truth of the matter. If we are finding ourselves in a place of discouragement, if you are finding yourself feeling like it's time to give up, to throw in the towel, I want to encourage you, before you do that, do this one thing, look back. In fact, if you're feeling discouraged today, if you're feeling like giving up, let me encourage you to look back in two ways. Look back, number one, on God's past faithfulness in your life. God's been faithful to you. Listen, God did not bring you through 2020 and 2021 uh, to leave you in 2022. Philippians 1.6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, Paul didn't know when the day of the Lord's return would be, but he was completely confident that God would not leave his people alone until things were brought to completion and it's the same way for your life as well number two not only do you look back on God's past faithfulness in your life but you also look back to those past uh, excuse me you also look back to the saints who have gone before you they are examples of what it means to be faithful let me encourage you now look back on God's past faithfulness and look back on those who have done it well Maybe you need to spend some time today thinking about those things in your life. Maybe you need to spend some time today thinking about how God has been faithful to you. Listen, I want to encourage you to do that today. I pray uh, that you will. 
If you find yourself discouraged at all, look back on what God's done in your life. Let's move on. Not only do we need to remember the encouragement from heaven, but number two, if we want to run in order to stay in the race, we need to run without the entanglements of this world. We need to run without the entanglements of this world. Look again at verse 1 with me. The author says he's surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and then he says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely so that we can, in other words, run with endurance. The words there, lay aside, offer us a picture of what it means to take off old, soiled, or ruined garments. The writer is telling us that if we want to run, to stay in the race, if we want to run with endurance, we need to decide once and for all to put off two entanglements this world offers. The first entanglement is that of the weight the author speaks of. What is this weight? Well, we know it's not sin because sin is directly addressed there in verse 2, or excuse me, verse 1. This weight here is not immoral. It's not wrong in of itself. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not even uh, something that's bad. It could be a good thing. It's, it, it's neutral. So why does the author tell us to get rid of this. Well, what does a weight do? It weighs you down. It distracts you from what is best. John MacArthur, I thought it was good, he put it this way. He said this, the problem is not what the weight is, but in what it does. What does it do? It keeps us from running well. A weight is whatever slows you down in the race of the Christian life. It's whatever cools your zeal for God. It's whatever becomes an easy excuse for you to miss church, except when it snows. Uh, it's whatever tempts you to compromise your values. It's whatever gets in the way of finishing the race well. My wife and I just moved into a new home about a month ago, and it doesn't take long, as many of you know, to realize that you have too many things when you begin to move. In fact, it's clear you don't really know what you have until you move, or in my case, what you don't want to move. For example, we own this large, heavy, weighty, incumbent, I've uh, ran out of weighty adjectives, black dresser. It is, in my opinion, a pointless weight we own, especially when uh, you're the one put in charge of moving it for the family. I spent way too long one morning trying to figure out how to make this thing disappear without my wife knowing. For some reason, and I don't believe it's of the Lord, she wants to keep it. Now, there's nothing wrong with this dresser, by the way. In fact, it's built well. It holds a lot of items. It looks good. And at times, it's been a good thing to have for our family. But it becomes a burden. It becomes a distraction when we want to move. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just a weight that was in the way of what I believed was the best. I wanted it gone, and she wanted to keep it. So what do you think happened? Well, we ended up compromising and we kept it. <laughs> a weight is, a, is not a sin, but it's a distraction from what's best. It's a hindrance that holds us back from running well. And here's the truth of the matter. Many of us never really consider the weights in our lives. And if we do, we really don't take the time to remove those things from our lives. So let me ask you today, what is your weight? Is it a hobby? It is, a, is it a possession, a relationship? Is it entertainment? Is it your occupation? You see, when you begin to cling to or begin to think more about things like that than about the lost person across the street dying and going to hell or investing in your walk with the Lord, I would say your weight needs removing. Or even consider this, if you simply come to church and sit on a pew, but never really get involved, or never give your entire life, as the Bible says, as a living sacrifice to the Lord, I would say that the world and its fleeting pleasures have become a distraction. I love what Martin Luther, the famous reformer, said. He said this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. So what is your weight? It's a personal question, by the way. I'm not imposing any of these scenarios on any one of you. You can't answer this for me, and I can't answer it for you. 
My weight is not your weight, but we all have a distraction that can hinder our race. And if we are going to run the race well, Hebrews tells us we better lay aside those weights. So what is your weight today? Not only does the author tell us to uh, lay aside every weight, but he also tells us to lay aside the sin. Now, obviously, all sins are, are a hindrance. All sins are wrong, and to be quite honest, there's a debate over exactly what the sin is here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Some argue it's a sin in, in general, it's just all sin, and, and that might be what the verse is referring to. I'm not throwing this out, but notice the use of the definite article there in verse 1. The Bible says, lay aside every weight, and the sin that so easily clings so closely. I think the article there seems to indicate that it's a particular sin. Now what would this particular sin be that the readers of Hebrews would struggle with? Well, I believe it's the sin of unbelief. And John MacArthur argues that if there's one sin that hinders the race of faith, it's unbelief. It's doubting God. It's so easy to become entangled to unbelief. And so the author knows this, and so what he does is he encourages his readers to remove the unbelief. I want you to think about this. When we allow the sin of unbelief in our life, it's so easy for Satan to open the door into our hearts and stop us from running. Think about your own life. During seasons of blessings, Unbelief lurks in our hearts, causing us to think that we don't need God. We don't need to depend on Him. It causes us to become self-righteous at times, thinking we're true heroes of our story. On the other hand, though, think about this. Think about the times of testing or the times of trials. Your faith in God is challenged. Is God really, you ask yourself, who He says He is? Do I need to doubt His promises and His character? We all have had those moments because... Why? Because the sin of unbelief lurks around our hearts and tries to enter at any point, whether good or bad. And so the question then becomes this, what do we need to do to lay aside this sin of unbelief, this doubting God's goodness? Well, let me offer four things quickly, and I mean very quickly. Number one, if you want to lay aside this sin of unbelief, Number one, know that you're not alone. You see, sin isolates, but you're not alone. Satan wants to get you alone. He wants to use this sin of belief to separate you, but you're not alone. In fact, God knows exactly what you're going through. And in fact, he knows more about your situation than you do. And by the way, if you're watching this, not only are you not alone when it comes to the Lord in your life, but you also have a church body here at Lebanon Baptist Church, who, who would love to help you. Number two, number two, consider the consequences of your doubt. The greatest consequence, I believe, in all of this, the greatest consequence of doubting God is losing the opportunity to depend on God. Did you catch that? The greatest consequence of doubting God, is losing the opportunity to depend on God. Think about the consequences. Number three, look for a lesson in your life. Look for a lesson in your life. When you want to doubt God, don't say, Lord, remove this. Don't say, Lord, I give up. Say, Lord, teach me. You see, God can use storms in your life to teach you, not to harm you, but to help you. But you got to be looking for those things in your life. Number four, learn to leap into the arms of the Father. Don't run to anything else when you doubt God. Run to God. He's not surprised by this. We should thank Him. Because if anything, the pain, the suffering, the heartache that's causing discouragement brings us closer to Him. I love what Charles Spurgeon said man of many sorrows, he put it this way, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. That's good. Learn to leap into the arms of the Father. 
Lay aside those weights. Lay aside the sin. And lastly, I'll finish quickly. Not only do we need to learn uh, to run by remembering the encouragement from heaven, and not only do we need to uh, run without the entanglements of this world, but number three, we need to run with the example of Christ as our focus. Notice verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 2 contains three of the most powerful words in the English dictionary, looking to Jesus. Chapter 11 gives us a list of spiritual heroes, but notice the author of Hebrews never tells us to look to those individuals. It's a good reminder for us, by the way. We're not told to look to David or Moses or Solomon, Elijah or Gideon. We're not told to to be like those Old Testament saints. And quite honestly, none of them have the best track record either, by the way. But there's someone who does, and there's someone we are told to look at, and very clearly we've read it, his name is Jesus. And so you want to help, or you want to find some help in running the race of the Christian life, let me encourage you to look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. The word look there has the idea of turning your gaze from everything else to focus on a specific thing. It's not ignoring everything and and everyone. It's not about that. It's about being so consumed with Christ that everything else is put into its proper perspective. So you want to run the race of life? You want to stay in the race? Fix your eyes on Christ. Now why should we do that quickly? Look at verse 2. Looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. We look to Jesus because of who He is. He is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. One author put it this way, from A to Z, it's all about Him. From A to Z, it's all about Him. It's not our perseverance that guarantees we will finish the race. It's the fact that Christ is the finisher of our race. Listen, we look to Jesus because of who he is. He's the founder and perfecter. But we also look to Jesus because of what he has done. He endured the cross, despising the shame. And by the way, Roman crucifixion uh, was shameful, and yet he endured the cross. Why? For the joy that was set before him. What was the joy? Doing the will of the Father, but also setting you and me free from sin. Aren't you thankful today for nothing else that Christ endured the cross for you? He endured the cross for you. But after that, not only did he do that, he also sat at the right hand of the Father. Listen, the cross isn't the end of the story. His death didn't close the book. This is highlighted for us at the end of verse 2, which tells us that Christ was enthroned. And then listen, as Hebrews 12, 3 tells us, I love this, Hebrews 3, excuse me, 12, 3 says, we should consider what Christ has endured to pay for our sins so that as a result, listen to this, we don't grow weary and faint-hearted. Listen, the answer to running the race of life is summed up in three words. Look to Jesus. Set your gaze on nothing else but Christ and his finished work on the cross. I'll end with this story. I remember the day I married my wife. It was November 3rd, 2018. I was standing at the end of the aisle with my father who was officiating the wedding. Each groomsman walked down the aisle with their bridesmaid. I would give them a nod and the next one would come and so uh, on and so forth. While I'm thankful for each of my groomsmen, I didn't come to the wedding to see them. I also saw all of those who came as guests, and it was nice. Some friends, some family members, and acquaintances were there, but listen, I didn't come to see them. In fact, to this day, I can't even tell you exactly who was there. 
I, I don't even remember exactly what time our wedding was and, and what the schedule was for that day. There is one person, though, I can distinctly remember. In fact, I can tell you how her hair was precisely fixed, what she was wearing, and exactly how she looked. That person, you guessed it, was my wife. And the moment she walked down that aisle was the very moment my gaze turned from whatever I was looking at to being completely fixed on her. It didn't matter who was there, what people thought, and how I looked. I focused completely on Hannah. And I'll tell you this, whatever painful situations I went through before her, it all made complete sense the moment I saw her. It made everything I went through worth it. Why? Because of who I was looking at. I wasn't focused on anything else but her. And she made it all worth it. Listen, friends, it's the same way with us in the race of the Christian life. If your focus is on something else other than Christ, you're missing it, and you will stumble. You will remove yourself from the race. Listen, if you are going to stay in the race of life, you better keep looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So let me ask you a question. What are you focused on today? Endurance is not found in anyone else. It's found by focusing on the example of Christ, removing the entanglements of this world, and finding encouragement from those who have gone before us. Listen, I pray that you will do that in your life today. We need endurance. We need to keep going. We need to practice what they did in Hebrews 12. I pray you'll do that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, you're good to us. We are so thankful for who you are and what you've done. We ask, God, that you bless the preaching of your word, that you will challenge our hearts to leave this place striving to live for you, to keep going when the going gets tough. We thank you for the power of Hebrews chapter 12, and we ask, God, that you use it today. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh